Uh, we've got three talks today, one by Yves Le Monnier and Uji uh, Kabadi. Um, this is participatory mapping and monitoring of diet landscapes using UAV remote sensing in Borneo. Then we've got Laura Soles and Jennifer Devine who are talking about spatial technologies and landscape claims, imagining Guatemala's Maya biosphere reserve. And then we've got uh, Ayla Duporge from the um, University of Oxford, um, who's going to talk about determination of optimal flight attitude, altitude, sorry, to minimize acoustic drone disturbance to wildlife using species audiograms. So if you could just give me uh, control of the screen, Naomi. Great. Uh, so I've been given a few minutes just to introduce myself. My name is Tom Richardson. I'm from the Aerospace Engineering Department at the University of Bristol. And uh, coming from the engineering side of things, we work on developing uh, drones for a wide range of uh, applications, including conservation. Uh, we have a, a number of different um, places that we focus on in the research that we do, unconventional sensing and actuation, um, trajectory optimization. Uh, we do various forms of control in including machine learning. Um, we look at the electrical systems. Uh, we often look at uh, bio-inspiration for the design and operation of the, the vehicles. Uh, we're quite uh, experienced in field operations. Um, for example, on the right-hand side there, you should be able to see a, a shot of Manam volcano taken from one of um, uh, the trips we had to, to Papua New Guinea looking at uh, volcanology and gas sensing. Uh, here's a slide that, that covers some of the work that we do in the UK. This is um, machine learning based control for agile and um, bio inspired uh, UAVs, where we've got a vehicle that can change the wing shape and we develop neural networks that allow us to, to fly them. We've done quite a bit of work in the field. Um, this was done in uh, Ascension Island, where we are taking multi-rotor drones that were mentioned earlier, and we are flying them up to above the uh, inversion layer, taking air samples, bringing them back down again. We heard a talk earlier talking about sampling the atmosphere. So this is bringing back samples for collection. We did over 100 flights there um, and bring them back to, to be analyzed in the UK. We are very interested in conservation, supporting the, especially the efforts of other, other people who are doing this. Um, so we've been out with um, Bristol Zoological Society to Cameroon, where we're looking um, at identifying the Cordofan giraffe and the numbers uh, locally in the park there. And we had one, one trip out there before um, um, COVID-19, but we're interested primarily in making the vehicles easier for other people to use and also reducing the overhead in terms of processing the imagery and identifying and detecting uh, the animals that are there. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work with volcanology. Um, this is out in Guatemala looking at uh, Fuego Volcano, um, where we're flying up and we're taking ash samples from within the ash plumes themselves. And we've been uh, operating there since about 2016, um, doing what is known as BV loss, which is beyond visual line of sight operations. Um, so in this case, up to about uh, 10,000 feet above takeoff and up to, to 15 kilometers from where we, we've taken off at the, at the launch site. And uh, I'm not sure whether this will come through given the bandwidth that we've got, um, but this is a video from in flight from one of our vehicles where we're flying over Fuego Volcano and we fly through the ash plume and we've got a uh, sample collection. We've heard a lot about um, image and capturing of, of imagery, capturing imagery, but deployment of sensors and actually carrying other sensors on board is something that we're particularly interested in in the lab. And this is flying through the, the plumes over the volcano in order to identify how that ash is dispersed as the, as the plume goes down downwind. So that's just a brief introduction to myself and the work that, uh, that goes on at the University of Bristol and the Aerospace Department. Um, and it gives me great pleasure now to uh, pass over to Yves Lemonnier, um, who is an Associated Professor at Toulouse University. Um, his research areas focus on biogeography, uh, landscape and tropical e ecosystem ecology, participatory land use planning and mapping. So if I stop sharing my screen, and if I pass over. Uh, 
Well, uh, thank you, Tom, and uh, uh, hello to everyone. So, um, okay, so, so um, my presentation today is about uh, participatory mapping for the management and monitoring of uh, community-based land use, uh, Dayak land use, it's uh, ethnic uh, in Borneo, using uh, UAV remote sensing. This is a joint work with at 4 in, uh, in Indonesia and the local university in, uh, in West Kalimantan. So actually, uh, the background of this uh, project about participatory land use planning uh, to try to uh, empower the local uh, community in uh, natural resource management. It's, uh, it's part of a rather big uh, program in Indonesia. We have uh, several uh, locations to try to develop, uh, to co-develop model for decision making in spatial planning, especially land zoning and community-based land management. Actually, in Indonesia, you have a lot of challenge in terms of uh, land use planning uh, uh, in the country. It's a big country, and uh, and uh, most of the time, it's what you see now on the screen. The the, the maps used are very uh, small scale, very very uh, crude. It's very difficult for uh, to get um, uh, detailed data for the local government. And uh, so the, the scale is very, uh, very not sufficiently detailed. Usually, uh, one to two hundred fifty thousand. So here, what you have here, it's a, it's a district. So of course, there are very uh, serious special inaccuracy. It's, uh, it's based on a national system, which is uh, okay for to work at national scale uh, of the country. Uh, in, uh, including various uh, ecological parameters, but uh, once you are in the, the field, in the ground, it's, it's really not enough. So not enough data, and especially no social data. So obviously, we need uh, we need larger scale uh, land zoning at the district and uh, village uh, level. So for this, very often we. Uh, sorry. Of course, the first idea and what traditionally we do is to use uh, remote sensing satellite uh, imagery. I mean, remote sensing, and it has a lot of uh, of problem in place like uh, Indonesia, in the Equator, where the cloud cover is is really almost permanent, so it's very difficult first to get a free image, uh, free cloud-free image. Uh, like last year, for instance, we get only two images of only a small part of the area. And uh, also, it's not optimal for uh, spatial and uh, and uh, temporal uh, resolution. We have repeat repeatability issue, uh, mainly because you get also phenological, uh, you cannot monitor phenological stage properly because most of the time, again, because of this cloud cover, if we get good data, it will be always during uh, the dry season. And uh, so it's very difficult to get, uh, to get data at the same time, at the same time of the year, if you want to answer, it's really quite difficult. Uh, and you have this issue of either you get free data nowadays, you have a lot of free data, but it's low resolution, or you can try to get uh, high resolution data, but it's always very expensive. So um, in this area where the cloud coverage is uh, also always very high, people will suggest to work on radar technologies, that's fine. But from our experience in vegetation mapping, uh, the radar work quite well with vegetation in swamp area, for instance, but once you are in a hilly or mountainous uh, terrain, it's quite difficult to interpret the, the data. So the idea of this project was to explore the feasibility, the advantage and convenience of uh, using small drone technology. 
to empower this community in negotiating and monitoring their land. So for this, you see on the on the bottom left, we have uh, six sites actually where we work with different communities. They are all Dayak uh, community, but you have several uh, type of Dayak uh, ethnic quite different in terms of everybody is uh, using, you see this kind of landscape is typical of Sweden agriculture, uh, very often hilly, and where you have this mixture of uh, uh, field, secondary, uh, regrowth, uh, some piece of forest, and, and uh, kind of mosaic uh, landscape. So, for this, in terms of methods, uh, the first thing, the very important one is for us to, to discuss with the community, of course, to, to explain exactly what we are doing and to get uh, their authorization. It's something that we, um, uh, that something that we, uh, we do uh, quite uh, regularly anyway when we work with the community in such area, you have to get permission from the elders from the head of the village, whatever, to, to work in the forest. So, but for the mapping uh, uh, purpose, it's even uh, absolutely necessary to properly explain to the whole, uh, to all community, I mean, to the whole village, uh, what we are doing, because as we have seen already in the previous uh, discussion, you can have a negative reaction as well uh, when uh, people are not aware. We have observe also people running inside the forest when the, the drone is coming. So we try to minimize this by having this authorization. What we use uh, very quickly without going into detail is this kind of um, uh, fixed wing uh, that was also mentioned at the beginning. So for us doing mapping, fixed wing is, is a better option than the copter because it can fly a bit longer and it can go to uh, also uh, longer distances. So uh, for us, it's a must, but as you can see, as it was mentioned also, sometimes it's quite difficult to find proper uh, landing and um, a place for, for the drone. So for this particular purpose, we, we fly at 400 meter elevation. So it means we have a resolution of about 10 centimeter and we fly always uh, after the burning season because we wanted also to monitor the the, the burn scar uh, just after agriculture to plant rice so for instance we can more or less map 3000 hectares in uh, three to five days and we can repeat this at the same time so after uh, the burning season means october in this part of borneo so every year for three years uh, we repeat exactly the same flight as I mentioned uh, before, we will not be able to do that with uh, satellite image. And then um, we uh, first, that's, it was mentioned also, we need uh, uh, an assistance for, uh, for, this, uh, for this creation of what we call the photo mosaic. So it's like uh, a lot of uh, discussion with the local communities as well in terms of uh, uh, what we can see on this, we bring back this photo mosaic and we start to uh, discuss with the village about what we can together identify on this, um, on this photo mosaic. Um, as I mentioned, so in that case, to prepare this data, we have to understand that you need uh, special software, you need some, uh, some technical assistance. Yeah? So that's, that's one part important to understand. It was mentioned already. And then we do um, just manual uh, di digitization of the image. I mean, uh, we interpret visually the image uh, ourselves. So of course, there is a bit of subjectivity, but this is also uh, made together with, uh, with the local uh, community. So we will go uh, almost everywhere in the field with the community, with people uh, uh, in their garden, in their, uh, in their forest, and we uh, understand together the, this uh, mosaic landscape, how it is, uh, how their landscape is, um, is um, constituted. And then uh, we also, of course, sometimes uh, have to, to look at the boundary between village. And this also 
one issue where you have to be uh, careful because uh, you you don't want to make conflict between the various villages so when we have this first product we also discuss with the neighboring uh, village around the, the main village so this first draft is presented to uh, also uh, to the other village it's, it's quite important and then together uh, we use uh, lo local knowledge, of course, to uh, to make sure that this map is a proper understanding by the community and not not from ourselves uh, in terms of vegetation science. So we will really discuss with them about the local uh, fall classification of the land use. So here you have um, you have Umai, which is just uh, after planting rice. Uh, Demon Muda is a young fellow. Demon Tua, old fellow. Utan is a forest and Pengerong an old uh, secondary forest. And you have various agriculture use like uh, the, the rubber, uh, more kind of uh, small older rubber plantation um, uh, uh, made by the, with the help of the government. But you have also on the top, in the middle on the top, you have uh, what we call uh, uh, Pulao, it's a kind of, um, reserve of uh, forest or mixed garden that more or less sacred uh, grove for the people there. And so you have piece of uh, forest like that that are, of course, very uh, important for biodiversity. For biodiversity, you have also the stem by way on the, on the right, which is a mixed garden, a very mixed garden of fruit trees, timber. It's also typical of this, um, of this landscape. It's very important for biodiversity and and uh, very often it look it uh, indicate also a former village uh, when they they move the village from times to times sometimes very far away you will you will find this kind of uh, mixture of fruit trees and it's uh, an indication of a former village very important for biodiversity so at the end you get this uh, very uh, detailed map actually uh, that's really made by the community in terms of classification and we just help in terms of interpretation uh, uh, on the photo mosaic but all this is really uh, made by the by the local people and uh, you can see that it's quite detailed compared to what we can obtain with a satellite image we have up to 25 uh, class of vegetation uh, and and also by doing this detailed work, uh, we realize or we can show to people that uh, this kind of landscape that is very often uh, uh, considered or by, by many people, especially government like uh, um, the past, like people uh, destroying the environment and destroying the, the forest and so on. Actually, you can see if you put all together the natural forest, the, the locked over, it used to be some company working in that area, but it's still a, a lot of uh, forest remnant. And all this, uh, all secondary forest and the sacred grove and this mixed garden, you have really uh, more than 35% uh, of uh, very high dense uh, vegetation. And even if you put the old fellow 10 to 20 years, it's also a place where you find a lot of birds and so on. So this, actually, this traditional landscape is quite, um, quite good for uh, biodiversity. And uh, this kind of mapping allows the people to defend better their, uh, their own um, uh, landscape. Very briefly also, the advantage for us was to, at the same time, uh, this, is, this one is not so it's not really participative, just be, we will go to the field with the farmer to know exactly which field is uh, belongs to who. The change detection, so never we will be able to do that with satellite in that area where you have also almost all the time so much uh, cloud cover. Yeah? But if you look at this, actually it was interesting to see that the, um, if you look at this uh, Sweden agriculture landscape, uh, actually, the, the, the new plots, the new farming plots are not taken from the forest, which is also something that you hear very often, but it's more 80% of these fields that uh, were taken from the grassland, from the fern savanna, or from the young fellow. So during these three years of monitoring, uh, this area of uh, burning uh, remained more or less constant. 
Uh, at the same time, it's, we notice that there are some fields that are burned almost every year, which uh, the people in the past will uh, will not do that. They will come back after 10 years, 15 years on the same plot. Yeah. So there is a tendency you now uh, that the Sweden cycle in this particular area is uh, shortened. And maybe that's not, not a very good news. And uh, we are uh, un trying to analyze why. Um, very briefly also, the, what we introduce also with the community is uh, environmental auditing, especially with uh, our partners, NGOs that are also working uh, in that area. I just mentioned this because we look here at the illegal mining, for instance, or we monitor some RSPO or all palm company. But this is a place where you have to be really, really careful because that's where you, you, you may end up with a lot of conflicts. You, create, you can create a lot of conflicts between, for instance, uh, the company and, uh, and the local uh, community. So you have, again, uh, you have to inform and get the consent of everybody uh, for this. So uh, it has been mentioned already by colleagues, but uh, in, our, in our case, in my perspective, this, um, this drone for participatory mapping was really uh, interesting. Obviously, it was more attracting, attractive to the communities that before we used to do just kind of sketch map uh, in the village. It was very time consuming and the result was also never, uh, never very interesting for local government, let's say. They, they were considering this not, not really serious. Yeah. So this participatory mapping with drone was much more attractive to, to the communities. We have a lot of uh, enthusiastic uh, people. So it's high cost effectiveness. Uh, we discuss you. You discuss at the beginning the costs. It's, it's true that uh, there is also high cost because we still need to go to the field to do some check, ground check. But it was also the case for satellite, and uh, because we we do a lot of uh, vegetation science, ecology, and so on, we, we always need to be in the field. And for us, it's um, it's actually high cost effective because we. We, uh, for participatory mapping, it's much, much easier and faster. There is a possible uh, social reinforcement of community, maybe. It's also my, my experience. And uh, what is uh, very uh, interesting is that uh, this control of data acquisition and ownership by the community, because we end up uh, by giving the data to them and um, that's true that you have this uh, issue of sharing or not the data because it's very, very detailed data of their field. But for instance, it has been uh, very uh, useful for uh, several, uh, you know, it was everywhere in Indonesia, people develop uh, a monitoring uh, project for Red Plus activity for carbon measurement and so on. So for this, uh, this kind of mapping was really essential for the, for the people. The weakness that personally uh, I, I found during this experience was the small payload. Of course, you cannot, uh, on this drone, you cannot have uh, too much uh, heavy equipment, the short flight time also. But nowadays, um, search so at the beginning, this VTOL drone uh, become more and more available and more and more uh, and, and cheaper. So I think, especially for us in Borneo, where you have uh, it's always very quite difficult to find a good uh, landing place. I think it will be a must to have this kind of uh, drone now. You have this issue of uh, maintenance and repair, of course. It's with a drone, you always, not always, but quite often you, you get some problem. Uh, the, the, the drone can fall and you need to be able to repair it on the spot. And this is also something important to consider. And we, you mentioned already during the first session about the potential social impact. I think it's something I am very happy to hear uh, uh, during this, um, this uh, conference. Some people question, is it really relevant for the community livelihood? Uh, so have, you have all this ethical issue, I think, uh, accusation of spying, privacy violation, potential conflict. I think this is really something very serious to, uh, to understand uh, properly. In conclusion, uh, so I find this really as a promising tool in participatory monitoring for the local community, uh, developing uh, their capacity to better manage and defend their land. It was, it was something that we observed when they were uh, facing the local government. 
but it should be kept in mind that technology still need to be used with caution at this community level. And this ethical issue remain extremely important to assess for organization introduce this kind of uh, technology to communities. For me also, uh, from my own experience, it was, it is maybe now it's the question is how to better integrate such collaborative work between academia, communities and NGOs with private sector and with local government, especially the special planning bureau, for instance. So there is a tendency now that everybody, NGO will have their own drone, the, the oil palm companies, they, dev, they have drone as well. The government wants to have drone also. So I think uh, here in Indonesia, uh, we need a much more uh, discussion about how to integrate this uh, together. Okay, that's all for me. So. Brilliant. Th thank you so much for that. Very much appreciated. Um, uh, just to remind everybody, we're going to have a, a short question and answer session at the end of this, where we're all going to come back uh, to, um, to to ask and answer questions. Uh, for now, we're going to move on to uh, Laura Souls, um, who is a Leverhulme uh, Early Career Fellow at uh, University of Sheffield. She researches in land rights, land cover, change use, um, indigenous forest community movements in Mexico and Central uh, America. So, um, uh, Laura, do you want to see if you can share your screen for me? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and hopefully this will work. Can everybody see that? Absolutely. Over Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to uh, speak to you a bit today about a paper I'm working on with Professor Jennifer Devine at Texas State University. And this is part of a lar my, my Leverhulme project and a larger um, set of collaborations, including with folks on this call, on this webinar, on uh, earth observation and community political claims making around land contestation. Um, so today I'm going to walk through a little bit about what sparked this research and, and provide a few examples of how landscape imagery and Im imaginaries combine and coincide uh, using the Maya Biosphere Reserve of Guatemala as an example. So in May of 2017, I was based in Nicaragua doing my dissertation research with the Mesoamerican Alliance of Peoples and Forests, or AMPB. Um, and this was a collaborative kind of participatory project. And as part of it, AMPB, or this um, alliance of 10 different second level community forest and indigenous forest organizations had asked me to um, support them and to, when they asked, kind of provide technical support. Um, so that ranged from everything from note taking to what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so, in May of 2017, I hadn't originally planned to spend any time in Guatemala as part of this project, but they asked me to go and support the um, Meso um, the uh, sorry Association of Forest Producers of Peten or ACOFO, which is highlighted up here in blue. So all of the areas highlighted in red here are community or indigenous uh, lands that are part of the Mesoamerican Alliance, AMPB. So the area in blue, and Naomi already highlighted some of this for us, um, is composed of these community forest concession organizations. And these concessions have rights to harvest timber and non-timber forest products over 25 year periods um, in their allocated areas. And this was part the fact that they're able to do this is because they're in the Maya Biosphere Reserve and the areas that are operated by the communities are part of the mixed use zone of the Biosphere Reserve, um, which means there's a mix of protected areas and then areas that are supposed to be under slightly less protection, but still with limited uses. Um, and so you've seen this image earlier in the day. Um, Akofop, so based up in that northern area, was really concerned with contemporary media depictions of forest fires in the Maya Biosphere Reserve um, and this kind of popular emerging discourse in national and international news coverage that this crown jewel of Central American conservation could be completely lost 
to anthropogenic fires that were raging throughout the region. Um, but of course, the fires weren't everywhere. And Aquafop and its forest monitoring teams, who actually invest their own um, income in very high level, uh, very intensive monitoring and fire prevention, they knew that they weren't seeing fires in the lands that they managed, even though this discourse suggested that the whole area was just on fire. Um, so they wanted to do something that would counter this narrative and to restate the importance of their community forest management efforts in the, and, and this is also in the context of the political um, struggle for the renewal of these 25 year concessions, the first of which is expiring in the next year. Um, so the resulting initiative, the support that they asked for uh, from the uh, Mesoamerican Alliance was to create a report and a media strategy. So this resulting initiative included training on drones and open source GIS uh, for forest regents who are kind of the uh, forest managers, a media strategy and campaign that included training for youth communicators on social media and outreach strategies, um, and this research report, which is where I was asked to come in. So this research report demonstrated through fairly simple kind of geospatial analysis that ACOFOP had protected lands from fire much better than those areas that were managed by the government. Um, and the national parks were in fact what was on, on fire. And they were able to show this through the use of publicly available spatial data. So what followed was a press event um, with government and donor agencies in attendance um, and community re representatives from Aquafop as well as these kind of Ford Foundation consultants who helped coordinate some of the strategy and trainings. Um, and all of this was this counter narrative um, to count and to counter this idea that the fire was everywhere because this destruction and loss uh, narrative was aspatial. It wasn't recognizing differences within the biosphere, bio, uh, the bio, Maya Biosphere Reserve in terms of management and outcomes. Um, so this, was fairly well received and did get a lot of national press. Um, and it helped, at least according to the communities themselves, facilitate the renewal of the first concession in the community of Car Carmelita. But of course, this spatial imaginary, this kind of division of the Maya Biosphere Reserve into concession areas and into this effective community strategy and these failing national parks, is not the only spatial imaginary in play. Um, the Maya Biosphere Reserve is famous for its um, Maya temples and pyramids, the famous Tikal, which if you saw the first picture of the slide, it was actually featured in the early Star Wars movies. Um, so one of the most significant of these archeological or heritage project, projects um, in terms of funding and media attention is led by a US-based um, archaeologist called Richard Hansen, and he's been pushing for a redesignation of parts of the Maya Biosphere Reserve for over 20 years to create what he would call a strict wilderness protection area that would cover the so-called Mirador Basin. Um, so he has historically used, along with other archaeologists in the region, satellite data and plane-mounted LIDAR uh, to identify this slightly lower-lying area that he claims would be typical for a large classical Maya, so pre-1000 AD uh, settlement, but with little regard to the actual contemporary land uses. Uh, so Hansen's maps and the results of this kind of analysis are a key tool that he uses to garner attention and to try and advocate for funding for, for his project. Um, and he has over the past 20 plus years received uh, attention and funding from the highest levels of both Guatemalan and the US government, although he currently has not been able to achieve the redesignation that he would like. Um, and his efforts are part of this larger and ongoing expansion of spatial data use, especially in increasingly drone and LIDAR usage um, by archaeologists and heritage preservation advocates. And this, there's a lot of exciting possibilities uh, 
for the use of these types of technologies. But I, I want to pull attention here to these these media coverage, this media coverage um, of Guatemala, but also a, 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 another area of Central America where I work in the Honduran Mesquitia. Um, that it's very much accompanied by a narrative of exploration and discovery that connotes both a colonial history and actively erases contemporary lands, land uses and populations. So drones and LIDAR are getting a lot of coverage as near earth technologies that are opening possibilities for understand, understanding sub canopy landscape dynamics in heavily forested regions, which as Eve highlighted, this is also an area with a lot of cloud cover. So there are clear advantages to being able to use these types of technologies, but also perhaps there are better opportunity or opportunities to better situate this work in the community, in the context of the communities who currently use these lands. So this is not a, a set of images from drones, but I think it's a really helpful side by side to understand this competing set of spatially based, geospatially based land claims. Um, so this is the area on the left of the so-called Maya Basin in Guatemala. And the top right map was produced by the Hansen archaeology team. And the bottom right map is one that I produced in cooperation with our partners in Acofop um, as part of the process of building these reports. Um, so both Acofop and Hansen's team are using the active fires data set from NASA, which is using um, MODIS and or VIRS, those are the two satellite instruments, um, that collect anomalous hotspots on the Earth's surface. And they're using these to make very different claims about what's actually happening on the ground and thus what the best way to manage the land is. So the first map um, or up here is labeled slash and burn fires 2002 to 2014. Um, and it makes it seem like there's this encroaching agricultural frontier that is moving ever closer into this um, priceless, irreplaceable archaeological site. Um, on the bottom, if you put the concession lands, um, and these dark areas are the concessions, and these lighter green areas are the national parks, and that of course is a, a choice on our part to emphasize the forested nature of the concessions, um, you can see that the fires are really concentrated in areas where community concession, the communities are not actively managing the forest. And we did these maps over history, uh, historically as well. Um, and the areas with the most fires are managed by the government or do not have any active management plan in place. So this story has led to uh, a change in conversations within Guatemala. It has um, kind of activated perhaps the re reconcessioning um, but I would say that it's still an ongoing struggle and, and the communities are still trying to think about how do we use these different technologies in ways that will effectively stop these claims on our land that will prove that we are effective community managers. So in the context of this particular paper, um, we're pretty still in kind of early days, uh, as with many people, COVID has put a bit of a damper on um, some of our research, but um, we are kind of moving forward through a literature review and try to think about community uh, production and use of geospatial data. So this is a really already fruitful workshop for me. Um, and so we're guided by these questions about how are different actors making use of space geospatial technologies to make claims about the appropriate use and management of lands, in this case, focused on the Maya Biosphere Reserve. And then to what degree have these different spatial imaginaries, which is what we are calling the kind of sets of map claims made, are they gaining political traction and how? So really quickly, just, this is what we would hope to do if, uh, regardless of whether COVID is in play or not. Um, but the main element here is that we make progress on this set of questions remotely, but it would be better to be in place. So just a few really quick early reflections. Um, 
I think it's worth highlighting that these there are a lot of critiques of mapping and spatial data that make important points, especially regarding knowledge production and exclusion and power. Recognizing that uh, kind of as Monica uh, indicated in her question before, there's something about observation that is very kind of Western scientific and that in some places might be a challenge. Um, and this prioritization of spatial data foreground certain ways of knowing over others, ones that can be mapped, ones that can be made into static or updatable visual cues. Um, and that perhaps ex excludes some other ways of being with the natural world. Um, but what we are also seeing is that in terms of the lived experiences of communities who are in these struggles for recognition and rights, and the possibility that they can produce their own spatial data and represent their imaginaries becomes a really important part of their survival and potentially thriving in a contemporary context. Um, so I think recognizing the limitations of geospatial representations in capturing the fullness of socio-ecological relations is important, but also recognizing that even these partial representations can contribute in really fundamental ways to the improving the lives and opportunities and rights of these communities. Uh, and I think the MBR, as perhaps Naomi would agree, is a really great place to observe some of these things. Um, so we'll look forward to our Q&A discussion later. And that's it for me. Thank you. Brilliant. Th thank you, Laura. Uh, so our la last speaker in the session is Isla Duporge. Um, Isla's research is focused on advancing methods using geospatial technologies to monitor wildlife and analyze movement in relation to anthropogenic risk. So Isla, do you want to see if you can share your screen? Sure, thank you, Tom. Um, are you seeing that? Um, yeah, we're seeing the presentation. Brilliant. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, great. Thank you, Naomi, for organising and co-organisers, and thanks, Tom, for hosting. Um, so I'm going to present, it's a chapter that's come out of my PhD thesis, which I'm doing at the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit um, here in Oxford at the Department of Zoology. Um, and the thesis, which I've just handed in, is looking at advancing remote sensing methods to monitor wildlife. Um, I've largely been working with satellite data, but this chapter is specifically looking at the use of UAVs to monitor wildlife. Um, and looking at acoustic disturbance. So just a, a kind of broad background. So UAVs are playing an increasingly important role in wildlife research monitoring and also for conservation purposes. Um, however, concern over disturbance has led several countries now to ban the use of UAVs in national parks. Um, so this is the case in United States national parks, unless you have uh, specific permits from the government and also in South Africa. Um, so disturbance is generally a welfare concern, but it also impedes the scientific data collection process because you're not observing typical wildlife behaviours, you're, you're observing kind of disturbed behaviours. Um, and also there's the risk that you're um, obscuring auditory communication between species, um, which would then cause them to displace time and energy from their primary survival functions, so feeding, mating, breeding. Um, so the idea of this paper was basically to deal with the issue of disturbance to enable UAVs to be used more effectively and ethically for scientific data collection. So here are just some examples of how UAVs are used for wildlife research. So um, several marine biologists are using them for biological collections. So blow samples from whales is a good example. Uh, monitoring morphometric attributes, so looking at the, the size and shape of different species, the skeletal systems. Um, and also collecting behavioural data. Um, so yes, assessing body mass condition um, or looking at kind of kinematic analysis. So there was a nice study that recorded the gait uh, of running giraffes. Um, also for census surveys, which we've gone over earlier, um, to, to provide account, uh, anti-poaching surveillance, although uh, questionable how well drones are working in this regard. Um, and then also mapping species habitat use and distribution. Um, also, you can uh, attach a, a radio receiver onto a drone, and then that can obviously record where radio tagged animals are, which um, I'm helping on a project uh, with Scottish wildcats, uh, where we're trying to do that for the, the tagged uh, wildcats that are left in Scotland. 
Um, and also drones can be used to relocate animals to mitigate human wildlife conflict. Um, so that's been done in the case of elephants because drones sound um, quite similar to bees and elephants are af afraid of bees. So drones can be used to move elephants away from cropland. Um, and the applications of how drones can be used for wildlife research are just very numerous. These are just some of them um, and they continue to grow. Um, so the advantages is they're less disruptive often than collecting data using manned aircraft or vessels. Um, and they can be used to access species in hard to reach and unsafe locations. Um, and now with the kind of um, advent of a lot of machine learning applications, we can also uh, speed up the detection process of species in the resulting imagery. So compared with like manned aircraft surveys, which are often just um, live observers counting, we have a record and can go back and, and check how many counts there are. So it's, um, it's bringing the field forward. Um, so why specifically I'm looking at acoustic disturbance? Um, so I was going to play a video, but I think I'm actually just hotspotting my phone, so I don't think the connection will, will do that, but I'll pop it in the chat if anybody wants to watch it afterwards. Um, there was a census survey that I helped um, on in, uh, in a conservancy site in southern Zambia, actually working with C4, um, so Davison leaves if that's uh, relevant to you. Um, we did that uh, two years ago. And um, the problem that occurred when we were doing that is that there's a lot of different species in the site. And so we didn't know what altitude to fly. So when we were planning the UAV survey, um, we maximized the ground sampling distance of the resolution of the pixels and scare any of the species. So flying at 120 meters, because um, we have quite a high quality drone. But um, afterwards I was kind of like, well, there should be some guidelines to, to help people who are flying over different species to kind of understand at what altitude you should fly so that you're not going to disturb them. Um, so I looked at what existing studies there are um, and most of them have just used observational methods. So when the species looks disturbed, so it's displaying size of, signs of kind of abnormal behavior, then they would say, okay, perhaps at that altitude, that's a, a sign of disturbance, but that's not very generalizable or scientific, I would argue. Um, and also a lot of the studies have also used uh, DBA weighting, which is a weighting that's um, looking at the frequency of the human hearing spectrum. So what we decided to do is to look at what audiograms exist. So what, what do we know about what species here? Um, so these, uh, this is a secondary data source that we relied on. So um, animals are brought into a lab for testing to, to understand what their hearing range is. Um, so they can either do that by giving them rewards of food uh, when, when they react to a sound. Um, and then the other technique is auditory brainstem response. So that's um, basically measuring brain activity in response to auditory stimuli. Um, and so from these methods, um, a lot of biologists have managed to record what the hearing thresholds are for different species. Um, and then we did some recordings of the sound output from different UAVs. So we chose just seven very commonly used DJI models of drone, uh, which you can see at the bottom here, the Inspire, a selection of the Mavics and the Phantom, um, and looked over the frequency spectrum, what, what are the sounds that are output from these drones and how do these vary with distance? We flew vertically and horizontally up to 120 meters, um, taking recordings every five meters. Um, and what we could see is that the noise emitted by different drones do vary quite a lot in terms of um, loudness across the frequency spectrum. Um, and the difference in altitude is, is higher at lower frequencies. So that basically means if you're flying closer to species, there's more variation between the sounds that they will hear across different drone systems. Um, however, if you're flying at 100 meters or higher, then it doesn't really matter which drone you're using because the sound levels tend to converge. Um, across the frequency spectrum. And so what we did is rather than use this DBA weighting, which is the commonly used one, um, which is uh, 20,000 kilohertz, uh, we looked at what species can hear and then we weighted the drone sounds according to what species hear. So basically we can now plot how a animal, for example, a reindeer would hear the Mavic uh, mini in this case at different distances. So by doing that, we then created a set of guidelines about which altitude you would want to fly at for different species using different drone systems. Um, so we can integrate the measurements of the UAV recordings with these uh, audiograms. 
Um, and so what was interesting was that we could see that the UAVs are heard very differently. So that like uh, one UAV would be heard about five decibels louder by a reindeer compared to an elephant. Um, and an elephant hears the drone, this is flying at the same 10 dB loud than, for example, a Californian sea lion. Um, so 10 decibels to human hearing means a doubling of amplitude in terms of our perception of sound. So they're, they're really hearing the drones very differently because they they all hear very differently. Um, so guidelines need to be created that you know take into account the fact that animals don't work in the same sensory system that we do. Um, and there's a lot more variation in, in, the, in short range. So again, if you're flying at 120 meters, then you don't need to worry too much about it. Um, also, uh, what we've uh, done now is created this set of guidelines, which is available online. So I'll also pop that in the chat. Um, so if you are planning a drone survey, you could have a look if your species has audiograms uh, available for it. And then we've given the weighting for these seven drones. Um, but so what was interesting really from this study for me was that um, we don't have a great understanding of how most animals hear. Um, so there's this, like a severe lack of audiograms. Um, and, but the method is a new one, I guess. So uh, it can also be applied to other sources of anthropony. So other man-made noise, which we know, you know, our noise and environment is increasing a lot. UAVs are just one source of noise. Um, so better understanding how quite useful to then work out mitigation strategies. Um, oh, and the paper's just been accepted in Methods in Ecology and Evolution. So that should be published in a couple of months online if it's of relevance to anybody. But I'll pop the video of the survey we did in Zambia and also a link to the guidelines in the chat. Um, and these are my collaborators. Uh, so this is Professor Holger Klink, who's the uh, Professor of Bioacoustics at Cornell. Um, my two PhD supervisors and two colleagues here in the Department of Geography who helped the study as well. Um, great, thank you. Back to you, Tom. Brilliant, thank, thank you, Ayla. Um, if all, all the three presenters could pop their video on for me, Laura and Eves. Brilliant, so we're, we're going to uh, Go back through some questions now. <laughs> Apologies, I am working on a rather small computer today. I was unexpectedly at home, which is why I'm struggling a little bit. Um, but if we start with yourself, Eves, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the ethical issues involved? Um, you touched on it briefly, but if you could talk a little bit more about that, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, it's a complex, uh, complex issue, and uh, you never realize completely when you arrive in a, in a, in a village exactly how this uh, drone uh, will be received. Already, uh, when you do participatory mapping, these ethical issues are not not new uh, for us. It's always a case uh, where you have to get proper uh, consent from the community to work with them, whatever. So it's something. Uh, uh, not really new for the drone, but the drone bring another dimension of this, uh, maybe this idea of uh, surveillance, which uh, or spying or this kind of ideas that uh, make some community uh, nervous uh, about exactly what, uh, or like if we have a hidden agenda, something like that. So, um, I think it's an issue that still has to be really uh, work uh, carefully together also with uh, local government, local foresters. I mean, uh, especially in areas where you have a lot of uh, potential conflict or already conflict between the oil palm company, for instance, uh, the national parks and, uh, and, uh, and the local communities. Local communities are uh, most of the time, for instance, accused to to continue to do burning, which which they do in Sweden agriculture, and uh, and uh, <coughs> very often uh, people uh, understand that it's also the oil palm company, but they are they are uh, they have more power, more protection. So this ethical uh, code, we don't have even a proper regulation yet in Indonesia about flying drones. So it's a lot a lot of uh, work to do and to study. 
Brilliant. And just as a follow up, you had a really interesting question in the chat, which was to do with the ownership of the data and, and, and where that lies and how you deal with that. You did pop back a, a, a reply to the question, but could you talk a little bit more about the ownership of, of data? And, uh, and then Laura will probably come to you afterwards also on, on a thought on that. Yeah, that's also uh, a bit uh, tricky, of course, because uh, we get a lot of uh, aerial photographs, which is uh, very powerful uh, data to, to do many uh, negative things as well. So does it make sense to give uh, a thousand of photographs digital to, to the, the head of the village? So, what we give is the, the maps, of course, the photo mosaic, copy of the photo mosaic and of the interpretation. And usually it's, uh, it's made also in agreement with uh, the, the whole village. Uh, the map is not signed by all villagers, but at least for the people who participate to the current survey. And we have a lot of, um, of uh, discussion at, at the end with uh, the, the whole uh, assembly of the village. But uh, so th there is this sense of ownership. Uh, we discussed with them also about this, this sense of ownership by the community, especially because they are very often uh, um, uh, approached by the old palm company, for instance, to buy their land. And uh, in that particular area, that's the border of Sarawak, uh, the, the, the Dayak, uh, Iban, they are really not very happy with this old palm company. So, so far in the past with our sketch map, they, they were going with sketch map to local government to defend their, uh, their right and it was not very successful. So they realized that with this uh, kind of uh, more modern uh, photo mosaic and uh, interpretation of it, where they can see, they can themselves identify uh, my hut in this garden or this particular place in the river so they can really discuss more powerfully with uh, with the local government and they look like uh, very proud of that but it's not not uh, completely satisfying in some situation we work with company i mean in rspo company we work ourselves we work more to to look at the biodiversity in the in the patch within rspo company for instance so Always we have this issue, this data, we give to company or not, we give to community or not. Uh, that's, that's something that uh, it's a bit complicated, but we have rules at C4 to, to share data. So it has to be clear at the beginning. It's, it's complicated. Okay, th thank you. Uh, Laura, could you address the same question from your perspective? So that's the sharing of data and the ownership of the data. Well, so from at least the case of, of Aquafluff, I think part of their push to create their own spatial data and do their own um, drone monitoring comes from the uh, kind of lack of or infrequent or, uh, kind of ad hoc sharing of data by the local government agencies who are in charge of monitoring protected areas. So a lot of the maps and um, kind of monitoring data that was coming out, um, even though Aquaflop is supposed to have a seat at the decision-making table for the protected areas um, board in the region, they weren't necessarily gaining access to the data that they would want to use to make their own decisions, which is why they then said, we're going to generate our own maps. Um, I, you know, so far what I've done with them has, in many cases relied on publicly available data, but in terms of the um, data that they're collecting themselves, the um, this, uh, mosaic, they're, they're trying to do, learn how to do that. They're using open source software to do it. Um, it's, been, it's owned by Aquafop. And I think that they are sharing the results of that with the government because they are required to submit certain sets of reports to maintain their concessions. Um, but I don't know the degree to which they're sharing the data. And I think in some ways they might not want to um, besides in static form. Um, but that's actually a question I'm gonna definitely be asking uh, because it's an interesting one to think through. Um, but yeah, a lot of this does come from the lack of sharing of the data by the government with the people who are actually 
on the ground doing the management day to day of these forested areas and the feeling like they couldn't give a rebuttal, for example, if a certain map said, oh, this has been deforestation and they can say, well, no, you see this and this and we're actually on the ground and we can tell you what happened. It wasn't, you know, us deforesting. This is what the other way to think about it would be. So that's part of their push to be capable in this regard. Okay, th thank, thank you very much. Um, can I actually follow it up with the second one for yourself? It's a variation of the first question we had, but it comes from Mural. How should the ethical aspect be addressed in remote communities? Um, do you have a, a view on that? <laughs> Difficult question, but uh, the ethic. Um, well, I, th I mean, I think Eve's point on free prior and informed consent is perhaps an important one, and that's dependent on the country you're in and the people you're trying to work with. Um, I hope this is getting at what the question is. Um, so in this area of Guatemala, there are not as many remote communities um, that, and they have their own methods for engaging these via this ACOFOP, uh, the Association um, of community forestry organizations. So they come together and they hold assemblies and they hold, they do their own decision making. And they're, I would, you know, I would say they like to use the word protagonists. They, they have protagonism in this process. In more remote areas, like some of the places I work in Honduras, um, I think what Eve described for how they got consent is pretty much what, you know, we would have to do if we wanted to work there as well. But I saw another question in the chat about places where uh, drone usage is, is outlawed or not. And I think that's a really important point because for example, in Nicaragua, drone use is completely prohibited in large part because the president of that country has some uh, paranoia around people trying to take drone imagery of, you know, somebody trying to take drone imagery of the presidential palace and he got uh, freaked out and banned all drones. And some researchers were trying to come in and had a drone and it got confiscated like really quickly. Um, but communities around there would actually love to be able to use drones because they're um, currently facing pretty strong um, land invasions. And this would be really helpful for them in, in both media and um, advocacy campaigns. And, but it's illegal to have a drone in Nicaragua. So I think that's um, perhaps also part of this uh, question around the ethics and who gets to decide about their use. Very good point. Um, Isla, there's one here for you. Um, that's a really uh, interesting use of drones for mitigating human wildlife conflict. Do you think that because drones sound similar to bees that there is a risk that poachers will use drones to herd elephants or other animals into easier areas of access? Uh, no, I think that's pretty unlikely because I think uh, poachers likely don't want to get uh, noticed. So they tell them to operate in quite stealth ways at night. So if you've got a drone up in the air, you're kind of giving your location away. Um, and yeah, if you've already spotted the elephants in, you know, to, to be able to launch a drone over them, you're probably within shooting distance anyway, or poaching distance. Um, th there's a follow-on question just afterwards. Um, is there any way in which conservation efforts could potentially be undermined by the use of drones? I'm not quite sure what they're getting at here, but. Is, is there any circumstances in which you think the use of drones could, could undermine conservation? Yeah, so there was this one um, video that went viral at one point, there was about 9 million views of it, where some, maybe some of you saw it, where people are flying drones over brown bears in North America, and the baby cub is falling down a mountain um, because it's disturbed by the drone. I think that's how it plays out. But I think, yeah, probably because we don't have a good understanding of the altitude at which to fly over certain species, then probably some people are doing uh, observational studies where they're actually disturbing the species. Also, in the case of the brown bears, there was also a follow-up study which was observing at what altitude to fly over a bear so it wasn't going to be disturbed. And then they repeat, so from, um, from an observational point of view, you couldn't see that the bear was disturbed. And then they did the same study using a biologger on the bear and the heart rate increased like three times its usual rate. So even though animals don't visually seem to be disturbed, they are disturbed. The same as if you know we're sitting in a cafe, somebody's talking in a very annoying voice behind us. We might not get up and leave the cafe, but we that's happening repeatedly. They might leave their home territory, or 
um, yeah, it's just a long-term stress, which would, would be bad. So yeah, unethical use of drones, or just uninformed use of drones, not necessarily motivated by unethical, yeah. Okay, um, th there is a following question I've got here as well. Um, so you were looking at the disturbance caused uh, by the audio signature of, of the drones. Um, have you any idea how that compares with sort of common disturbances such as cars or humans walking uh, or other well accepted methods for studying wildlife? So, so where does the disturbance from drones fall into that, that sort of spectrum? I think, yeah, very difficult to do comparative studies between different sources of disturbance because the factors will be quite different if you're on the ground in a vehicle or even with manned aircraft. I mean, you could do a comparison with manned aircraft, but yeah, I don't think there's that. I haven't seen any studies that have looked at um, different different comparisons between how much disturbance is caused from uh, different means of just accessing the animal. I mean, satellite monitoring would be the ideal because then there's no ground presence at all, but just the resolution of the imagery isn't high enough yet, but will be at some point. Um, so we don't have to be there at all. But that's just one of the big problems with wildlife monitoring generally is that you're going to be causing some form of disturbance. And I do think UABs used well will mitigate disturbance. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got one that was uh, in the chat here. This is to Eves and to Laura. To what extent have the communities you work with engaged in drone data acquisition and image processing for map making? And I think, Laura, you talked a little bit about this before. So maybe Eves, if you want to start with that one. Yeah, in our case, uh, so far, not yet. Uh, we don't have any uh, experience of community or training the communities themselves to use uh, the drone and do the data acquisition. It's always uh, colleagues from local NGOs that are, are used to, to this equipment. The, the drone we use is not very friendly, so it's a bit it's a bit complicated. But uh, now we we will start a new program because we have a kind of participatory monitoring uh, program for biodiversity uh, in one area, a, kind, a corridor between two national parks. So we want to uh, to start with this uh, participatory monitoring. So. We have not identified exactly which group of animals we are going to are going to be monitored by the by the village, uh, by the community. In that case, yeah, we are considering to uh, also to train uh, some people from the village to use uh, uh, small small drone like uh, like Mavic or something like that. Okay, Laura, have you got anything to add in addition to what you've said? Um. I would say that I think this is a, a challenge um, somewhat in the Maya Free Reserve, definitely in other parts of the Mesoamerican um, Alliance, that there aren't, there isn't access, uh, consistent access to good enough internet to be able to use um, some of the tools for um, kind of the open source or online uh, mapping tools. And also just there aren't necessarily um, high enough powered computers to sometimes, uh, or external hard drives are hard to come by and very, very expensive. Um, so there's some just clear kind of hardware challenges for communities to be consistently processing their imagery. Um, but it is part of some of the training program. And I think Hyena has done some work on this in, in Latin America as well. Um, but it was definitely part of what was so striking to me when I was there in May of 2017 was not just the drone usage, but, you know, I walked in, I was in a room in meetings and I walked into the other room where all of these community forest regents, all male, I will note, were sitting around computers that had been brought in just for them to learn how to use QGIS. Um, and they were looking at this data and, and stitching it together and learning how to use these tools. Um, but I don't know the degree to which even though they've now learned them, they're going to be able to consistently use them. So that would definitely be part of my, that's hopefully part of my research going back. The original plan was that I would have been there in uh, mid to late 2020, but alas, that has not happened so far. Um, and I think in, in Guatemala, this is gonna be less of a challenge because there is some data infrastructure there in a way there just is not in parts of, for example, Honduras, 
um, or Nicaragua where other um, and indigenous groups are, are interested in some of these same questions. Um, there you don't have electricity most of the time. So that's definitely a large challenge for communities to be able to operate um, drones and charge them and get them going and then to process the data themselves. Okay. Um, here's one from Seth, which I'll open to, to all three of you. Um, what about rights to share drone data with potential uh, ML, which I assume is machine learning? So you've got databases that have been labeled and, and to what extent have you shared or might you share or would you be able to share that data to enable um, uh, machine learning to take place? Well, I can, I can answer first about this at C4, we are... Uh, it's not this time it's not about participatory mapping or it's more about the drone ecology by itself and uh, recognizance of species this kind of thing that um, for ecology we are very much interested in using the drone also for calibration to uh, to the satellite data but for instance uh, yeah to look at the structure people have mentioned lidar and so on to, to we are very much interested to to use the drone as a uh, a much uh, more precise way to look at the structure of the vegetation of the forest eventually uh, later to be able to, to do something also uh, like we used to do with satellite about the functioning itself of the ecosystem so in that case yeah the, the data themselves they are they should be uh, available for uh, for people uh, able to uh, to uh, to enhance uh, the understanding of this data set. And uh, for instance, we try also uh, to use with this kind of data to use object-based classification uh, to, to have kind of more uh, automatic uh, way of looking at these uh, detailed vegetation types, for instance, and uh, recognizance of species, which is in tropical rainforest, which is really, really something difficult anyway. But even sometimes when we want to, for instance, to monitor the rubber, because it's a big question in Indonesia, not the rubber in small holder plantation monoculture, but the, what we call the jungle rubber, it's very difficult to assess uh, with satellite imagery because uh, a jungle rubber inside mixed, uh, mixed garden like that looks very much like a secondary forest. So we were hoping to do something, for instance, with drone. Uh, so this kind of, uh, in parallel to the participatory uh, uh, work with the community, there is this uh, huge potential of ecology that uh, we are interested to, to develop uh, at C4 uh, for the time being. Okay, thank you very much. Um, anybody uh, else have a comment or should we draw it to a close there? Um, I'll just say one thing on uh, like um, computer vision work, automation detection of wildlife in imagery, because that's gone quite far in some areas. But if we're going to kind of pool training labels to be able to train up machine learning algorithms to automate detection of species, then um, would it, the consistency of the altitude and the drone used would be probably uh, quite important. So it's probably better if one organization creates loads of training samples rather than kind of a mixed match of different researchers uploading to different images of uh, their, their labels specifically. So um, I know Microsoft AI for Earth are trying to do this now for cattle um, from satellite imagery. So maybe they could kind of spearhead um, getting a lot of drone training samples to, to use machine learning to be able to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, I think on that point, we'll draw it to a close. Thank you so much to, to all three speakers. That was really, really fascinating. And, uh, and all the contact details I've seen are in the, in the program at the end. So if you want to contact you, then feel free to email them. Um, Naomi, can I pass back to you? Wonderful. Thanks so much, Tom, and to all the panel for that really rich um, discussion, uh, picking up on the earlier, earlier panel and taking it on further feels like we're setting the scene for a really rich dialogue over the coming days. So we're going to take another very short break now. Um, we're going to resume 
at 3.30 BST for another talk on um, communities using drones from two guests from Mexico. So please rejoin us in 15 minutes if you would. <laughs>